Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Arthur Luxburg. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I'm a regular participant in the work of the uh, concurrency study group inside the ISO C++ standardization committee. Um, I'm, uh, I'm serving there as the editor of the technical specification for C++ extension for concurrency. I am one of the contributors to the TS. I also coordinate the work of other contributors. So what's a TS? Concurrency TS is one of the papers proposed um, by the SG1, Concurrency Study Group. This is how the Concurrency Study Group uh, tries to advance the state of the art of uh, concurrency in the standard C++. Uh, a technical specification is not a part of the standard. However, we hope to ultimately make it part of the standard. It is difficult to predict at this uh, point uh, which version of the standard will it appear in. But uh, regardless, uh, we hope that this uh, technical specification remains an authoritative document. There will be implementations widely available on many platforms. Microsoft is building one. Boost already has one. I know there are some people in this room who have built partial implementations of the TS. So you should be able to use uh, the tools in the concurrency TS in your code. If not today, then sometime very soon. So what's in it? The TS has three main components. One is improvements to STD future, which allows us to compose multiple futures in a weight-free manner. Uh, a couple of new concurrency primitives, latches and barriers, and also uh, a new concept uh, that is very useful for uh, log-free programming, which is the atomic shared pointer. So you should not uh, uh, think of this TS as a single cohesive feature. Rather, it's a collection of features that the, uh, the committee could agree on. Uh, it could have been less, it could have been more. I'm happy that we have what we have here. Also, this TS is not the end of the road of this work. Uh, this is a V1 version of the proposal. There is going to be a V2 and V3. We know there are missing features. We're working on adding more. So let's dive in into the first feature. Uh, the first proposal is called Improvements to STD Future. As a quick refresher of uh, what, is a, what is a future, you can think of a future as a uh, as, a, as a proxy for an eventual value. Typically, a future is used together with a promise. And uh, somebody who creates a promise can then set the value on it, and then that value will be stored in the associated state, which is typically uh, heap allocated, although some implementations exist where it isn't heap allocated. And then the future, typically on another thread, can then retrieve the value from the shared state, or wait for the value to become available. A future is very uh, useful for representing long-running uh, operations, or any operations where we need to wait for the results to uh, become available, and it's not immediately available. So a typical use of a future would look like this. Now imagine a case where we are reading a string from a file, right? The first uh, one, one of the ways to uh, get the value out of it is to call the get method. And uh, when the value is not immediately available in the future, that call will block the current thread until the value becomes available and then extract the value out of the future, right? If the calling thread is a scarce resource, which, which happens, uh, a preferred way to consume that future would be by attaching a continuation to it. And that's, that's the dot then method. This is, the, this, is, this is part of the proposal. Again, the, the get part is what we have today, and the dot then method is what uh, we are proposing in, the, in that proposal. The then method takes a callable object. Typically, this would be a lambda expression in which uh, you take the future and then call get on it. That get is then guaranteed to be non-blocking, and then you can use the value, right? And the reason we pass the future in it and not, uh, and not a string is because uh, we also want to take care of exception. And if, if exception is thrown, then 
a call to get, and the result will uh, resurface that exception, right? So the interesting uh, part about the then is that uh, the function itself returns a future, and the, re and the type of that future is determined by the return type of the uh, expression inside the then. In this case, we're returning an integer, therefore the return type of the then is going to be a future of int, okay? Another useful property of uh, the then method is called the implicit unwrapping. Very often when you uh, work with futures and continuations, you find yourself uh, invoking an asynchronous operation inside of the callback of the handler of another asynchronous operation. In which case, if you look at this example, we're reading a string. Uh, uh, that string represents a URL, and then in the subsequent operation, we are downloading HTML from that URL. And here, we are returning a future of a string, right? So had we followed the regular rules for the return types, the type uh, of the the type returned of the then expression would have been a future of a future of a string. That type is not very useful, therefore implicit uh, unwrapping, unwrapping kicks in, and that's why this type becomes uh, a future of a string. And this is what allows us to do uh, what we call uh, chaining, continuation chaining. Very often in code that uses uh, continuations and futures and continuations, you uh, you'll see this as a pattern. You read something, or you perform an operation, inside the operation you perform another operation, return that, and you can immediately attach another continuation to it, right? That's sort of, this is how you can uh, uh, string together multiple uh, asynchronous operations. Uh, in addition to the then method, the TS also introduces two operations that act on multiple futures, the join and the choice. The join creates a future that becomes ready when all parameters passed into it are ready, and choice creates a future that becomes ready when at least one of the parameters is ready. Both join and choice come in two forms, homogeneous and heterogeneous. This is a uh, homogeneous case. Uh, here, the join is implemented by when all operation, which takes a range and returns a future of a vector of a future of an end. And it looks a little bit intimidating, but the good news is that most often you don't have to spell out the type, you just say auto, right? In this case, I spelled it out so that I can explain it what it is. First of all, the return type is always a future because it is an asynchronous operation when all doesn't wait, right? Second, the vector is there because um, we take the futures that are passed into the function through the range and move them into a new container, which is the vector. And finally, it's a vector of a future because instead of moving the values into the vector, we are moving actually the original futures into the new vector. We never unpack a value out of a future and, and move it. We only move the futures themselves. And of course, because it runs a future, you can attach a continuation to it and process that continuation like here. When you go through the vector, uh, it is guaranteed by definition that every future in that vector is ready. This is a heterogeneous example. Uh, the return type of when all is uh, a little bit more complicated. Now it becomes a future of a tuple of a future of int and a future of a char. Again, it's a good thing that you don't have to spell it out. You just say auto. Uh, and then extracting the value out of that future is very uh, similar to the previous example. Choice, uh, homogeneous example works like this. We call when any on the range of futures. The return expression is going to have a type of a future of when any result, which is just a struct of an index that represents the future that is ready, and the container itself of a vector of a future of an int, right? And when I consume that future, I can index, uh, I can use the index, which is a member of the when any result 
and the future that I get this way is guaranteed to be ready, right? At this moment, more than one future can be ready, but at least one, this one, is guaranteed to be in a ready state. Uh, and finally, this heterogeneous example gets uh, even more complicated. Now, the return type is a future of an any result of tuple of a future of int of future of char. Uh, and uh, consuming this is also straightforward with the exception of uh, you cannot use the index, which is a runtime variable, to index into the tuple, right? That's why I'm using an if statement here. If the index is uh, zero, then I'm using, I'm going to use the get of zero. Uh, free function to extract that value out of the tuple. So, we have seen how futures can be used for sequential composition as well as join and choice, right? So futures are very good for creating graphs or expression DAGs, if you will, right? What if your problem is not, is not a DAG, right? What if you have some cycles in that graph? Let's imagine a case where you're reading something from a file and you have a trivial, a simple file reader class that has a constructor, Boolean function is EOF that indicates if the reader has reached the end of file and the get next string function, right? So let's try and see how we can use uh, futures and continuations to work with a reader like this. A synchronous way of consuming uh, uh, text from that reader is straightforward. You're looping until the reader has reached, has not reached the end of file, and then within each iteration you call result.get, that is a blocking call, of course, and then you print out the value. Let's try to do it asynchronously. So in this case, I'm uh, attaching a continuation to the result. I'm getting the value, and then I have to do something else here, right? But this being an asynchronous lambda, this, this, this is where it becomes more difficult. I cannot jump out of a lambda into the middle of the loop, right? Especially an asynchronous lambda. So what do we do? So let's try something like this. Obviously, this isn't going to be a scalable approach, but just, just humor me for a minute. Sometimes uh, it pays to write ugly code before we can see patterns and then we refactor that code and turn it into something more reasonable. What if I'm simply, uh, I'm just gonna repeat what I did in the for reading the first line and come up with something like this, right? And I, I can do even more and I can repeat it again, right? We, we all have widescreen monitors nowadays and you know, we can go pretty far. Uh, but uh, joking aside, this is the point where we start seeing some patterns, right? There's something that we do in each iteration. That's the first observation. So this piece of code in, the, in a brown block, right? We read the value out of the future. We print it on the screen. And the second observation is, because we cannot use uh, iteration, the next tool that we usually reach for when we cannot use iteration is what? Recursion, right? So let's, let's do that. Now, this is a function that reads um, uh, reads from the file. The func is something, is something that is passed by the user, right? And it invokes uh, itself recursively. I should say that it's not a recursion, it's a pseudo-recursion because typically we invoke uh, the function itself on a different thread, right? But it's just still a sort of a kind of a recursion. And we're done, right? We can, we can stop right there. But of course, we are engineers, we like to build reusable components. So let's try to generalize it even further. So one observation here is that in every iteration, there are three main things, right? There is a predicate that we invoke and that tells us whether we need to continue iteration, right? Then we can make it, again, something that a user can pass into a function. It's a parameter. Next, we have an iterator. We call the iterator that yields us the next value in each invocation. Finally, there is a user-provided functor. So we can write a function that looks like this. Make iterative future. Uh, you can use it for reading from a file. You can use it for pretty much anything, right? Invoking this function would look like this. Again, quite reasonable, right? Not, you know, not, not super simple, but reasonable. So 
We started with this. Simple, innocently looking uh, synchronous code. And wound up with this, right? Even if you consider that this part is going to exist somewhere in a library, this is still hard, right? This is probably too, too complex for a regular user. And the truth is, this is the point where uh, we are, we're reaching the point of the limit of how far you can go with a library-based solution. But don't despair. A better solution is on its way, and it's called the await. Two things are happening here. First is a read async function uh, needs to return a future, maybe a future of await, or some other type that represents an operation, an eventual operation, right? It doesn't have to be a future, but you know, if it started with future, let's continue to use future. Second, uh, we simply rewrite result.get into await result. And at this point, we are done. It's uh, easy to write, easy to read, it's efficient. And at this point, you might be wondering, okay, so if we have that, why even bother with concurrency TS? Why even bother with the then function, right? Why can't we just wait a little bit longer and get this into the language and, and we'll be done? And that's a reasonable question. But of course, if you're using futures today, what futures uh, lack, what they lack today is the ability to store continuations, right? And the then function is what adds that ability to the future. Uh, the difference between C++14, what you can do today, and what you will be able to do when a wait is in the language is that today it's you, the programmer, who invokes the then method. In the future, it's mostly going to be the compiler that invokes the, invokes the then method, right? We human beings have uh, difficulties reasoning about asynchrony because it means that we have to essentially rewrite our code into, into a very functional form. Compilers have no problem dealing with that. So, I highly recommend that you attend uh, Gordon Shanov's talk tomorrow. Uh, he is the expert. And uh, at this point, I'm gonna move on to the next uh, part of the concurrent CTS, latches and barriers. So somebody uh, using condition variable for the first time might naively do it like this. So in this case, I have two threads. One is the detecting thread. It's a thread that detects a condition and then notifies the other thread, the waiting thread, that the condition has occurred, okay? So again, naively, I'm going to use a condition variable wait. The wait requires a unique lock. I'm gonna give it a lock. The lock requires a mutex. I'm gonna give it a mutex. Save, compile, run. It will compile, and it will run about 50% of the time, depending on the timing, right? There are, there are many big problems with this code, right? But uh, the, uh, the frustrating part is that it compiles. First of all, of course, the, 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 the big red flag that should pop up in your head when you see this is, what's up with this mutex? Uh, what is the shared state that this mutex uh, is, is supposed to protect, right? Obviously, that's definitely a bad smell. The second is more subtle. It so happens that if you notify the condition variable before it enters the wait, that notification is ignored. Uh, the other problem here is that this simple wait uh, fails to take into account spurious wake-ups. It just so happens that an operating system can wake up a condition variable for other reasons, reasons other than the other thread notifying it. So uh, it, is, it is hard to get right, but this is one way how we can get it right. So we're introducing a new state. It's gonna be a Boolean, call it Boolean bool flag. When we notify, the before we notify the condition variable, we set it under a lock, and then we call notify one. In the waiting function, first we check that flag. Uh, if, the flag if the condition is not met, then we enter the wait and then repeat. So first of all, this solves the problem of premature notification in, a way in that we set the flag and then notify, right? And then the waiting side will first check the flag, and if the flag is set, 
will, it will never even uh, go into the weight, right? So that takes care of that uh, uh, timing problem. Now, this while loop there will take care of spurious wake-ups. Uh, if the condition variable wakes up for another reason, uh, we iterate again until the condition is true, and eventually we'll exit that loop when the condition has been satisfied. Uh, an alternative syntax would be to call the, to put the predicate in the wait function directly, right? I, I personally like this syntax more because it makes it more explicit that we, we check the predicate first before we enter the wait. Uh, this syntax does exactly the same, but if you're not sure what's going on here, you have to, you have to look it up. The other thing that I had to do to make this code uh, more efficient, this is an efficiency issue and not a correctness issue, is adding those two uh, curly braces here. Uh, you should know that notifying, condition, notifying of the condition variable doesn't need to happen under lock, right? It's okay to do that, but uh, for better scalability, you don't want to hold the lock for longer than necessary. Idiomatic code like this shouldn't be that hard. Uh, and this is why uh, Scott Myers, in his book, suggests that instead of condition variable, just use a future of void, right? For the reasons that I just stated, okay? And this, uh, the advantage of this approach is, of course, this code is correct by construction. You write it, it compiles, and it will be correct, right? The additional upside here is that you can also traffic exceptions for a future. Uh, the P promise here can accept an exception. You can, you can kind of pass the exception through a shared state. There, there's a couple of downsides here. One is that the promise is not reusable. So every time you try to use it again, you wind up creating a new shared state. And that is, as I mentioned previously, is typically heap allocated. Now, if you're writing an app and you know that this isn't going to be in the hot path of your app, then you can take that hit and that's okay, right? If you're writing a library or a a low-level reusable component, then it's much more difficult to make that judgment call, right? You always want to err on the side of, let's be as efficient as possible and not take any performance hits. Enter latches and barriers. The TS introduces uh, three different types. Latch is a simple thread coordination mechanism that allows one or more threads to block until a condition in operation is completed. Barrier is similar. Uh, but it can also be reused, and if Lex barrier uh, takes a callback, uh, that gets notified when the, uh, when the latch opens. This is how I would rewrite my previous example using uh, the latch. Here I'm creating a latch of one. One is a counter here. This is the number of times that the detecting thread must call count down, okay? And the waiting thread would call wait, and uh, the latch opens when, uh, the count, when the count reaches zero, okay? Uh, Windows programmers are familiar with the concept of event, right? Event is exactly like that. It's a, it's a latch of count one. Uh, how you can use it? Here is we are waiting for all tasks uh, to finish. I'm starting a bunch of tasks, and I'm using a latch of task count. Every task, when it finishes, decrements the counter. And then in the calling thread, I'm waiting for the counter to reach zero. OK? Another example, I'm starting a bunch of tasks and then immediately uh, freezing them, waiting for the latch uh, uh, to open, right? In the meantime, I'm preparing data for those tasks. Once the data is prepared, look at this prepared data, I'm unleashing all the tasks and they start doing the work. So that's all what latches and uh, barriers are all about. I'm not going to go deeper into the difference between latches and barriers, but this gives you the overall idea. And finally, part number three, atomic smart pointers. Most people are familiar with uh, compare exchange. This is a bread and butter of uh, log-free programming. The idea, a typical pattern, is like this. You, you read the original value, you compute a new value, 
and then you replace the old value with the new value that you've just computed if the old value hasn't changed. And if it has changed, then you repeat, right? This is what uh, this uh, while loop is doing. And often, when using, when writing uh, uh, log-free data structures, you'll find yourself using a shared pointer, right, to, to manage the lifetime of the nodes in this example of a, uh, uh, log-free list. So there is a couple of problems in this approach with what we're doing today. First of all, uh, it's, it's error prone. You need to rely on developers' discipline to always use an atomic operation whenever, uh, whenever you, you try to access the, uh, the shared pointer, right? There is no, currently there is no way to declare an atomic shared pointer. That's what this, that's what this proposal is uh, proposing. And the other problem is that it's, it's pretty hard to implement atomic compared change efficiently unless you're willing to penalize all users of shared pointer. Because a naive approach would be, hey, let's just put a, a spin lock or a mutex inside a shared pointer, right? But that would uh, impose overhead on users who don't care about using shared pointers in an atomic way. So for example, a Microsoft implementation uses a single uh, a global uh, spin lock, and you can imagine how scalable that is. Uh, LibC++ is a little bit more uh, sophisticated. There's a, a hash of uh, mutexes. There's 16 mutexes, and then it is more scalable, but there is more upfront cost in accessing the right mutex, right? So it is still uh, problematic. Uh, with atomic shared pointers, this problem is solved. First of all, the access to the object is guaranteed to be atomic, just through the nature of the type. And second, uh, operations like compare exchange now can be implemented more efficiently. Yes, you can implement it by uh, putting a mutex or a spin lock inside an atomic shared pointer. Perhaps there are more efficient implementations, but at least that would be better than what we have today. And this brings me to the end of this uh, talk. Uh, for references, uh, I recommend, first of all, reading the latest concurrency TAs paper on this link. Uh, you can snap pictures or the slides will be available so you can, you can get that. I, I find it very useful to sometimes uh, go back to the original papers and read the original papers that introduced the concepts because they have the rationale. They also seem a little bit naive in retrospect, but at least they have the rationale that in uh, later revisions of those papers tend to get lost and just replaced with standard Ds. So those three papers are the original papers that proposed uh, the components of the TS. And I also found this uh, blog by Anthony Willems very uh, useful in understanding why do we need to have a shared pointer. So I have about uh, 10 seconds to spare, I think, and uh, some time to answer questions. Thank you. Ah, a question. So, uh, we have the atomic shared pointer. They sound really great for log free structures and stuff like that. But they're not going to be actually locked in time. It's not always if you do something then you always have to do both like the actual value of the point and yeah. the So the question was Yeah. The question was atomic shared pointer sounds like a, a like a good idea, but it's probably not gonna be log free. And the answer is uh, you're probably right. It probably will not be log free. There, there is a function called is log free that you can call and check whether it is log free, right? Uh, but what you really care about, not whether it is log free or not, but whether it is efficient and scalable. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Uh, thank you for your attention. That's all I have. <laughs>